Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Steve Edwards. Hello from, what am I, warm and rainy Portland. Cold and rainy Portland, actually. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and we've got a special guest this week. It's Nick. Is it Kalyani? That's right. Uh, Nick, do you want to just Hi. introduce yourself, let everybody know who you are and why you're famous? I wouldn't call myself famous, but I'm coming in from Mountain View, uh, California, Silicon Valley. Oh. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, a company called Decentology. And what we are doing is we are building uh, this is a platform for Web2 developers uh, to start building on Web3. We want to make it super easy for that to happen. And what we've done little that JavaScript developers everywhere know, NPM. So NPM install modules. Uh, we are extending that same capability to Web3 and blockchain so you can easily build applications without having to learn any new languages or anything. You stick with JavaScript, HTML, and build things out. So uh, that's what I'd like to... Uh, uh, talk about today uh, about building about blockchain and Web three in general. All right, so there were about eight buzzwords in there, um, <laughs> just with the blockchain and everything else. Um, I'm a little curious because I've I've heard a number of things about Web three, and I'm not exactly sure. Like when I try and explain it to people, I'm like, this is what I kind of understand, but I don't feel like I explain it well because I don't completely understand it. So what? Like, what is Web3? What's not Web3, you know, regarding the stuff that's out there? Like, how do we clarify this so people go, oh, that's what it is, and that's how it relates to what I do, you know, using current web technology? Really good question. So I think of Web3 as two parts. The first mm -hmm. part is the technology, and the second part is the culture. Uh, so let's talk about the technology for first. It's basically any any technology or set of technologies. And I want to be clear here that there's a distinction between distributed and decentralized. This literally means that there isn't a single point or single service authority. So decentralized systems can be blockchains, be storage. There can be other protocols uh, also. For example, there might be an identity protocol that doesn't really blockchains or storage or might rely on both you know so the idea is more about not having a central uh, control point or a central entity that controls it and it's uh, an infrastructure where there isn't a central point where all the infrastructure is the technology aspect of it and the canonical example of decentralized technology blockchain you know uh, the the more technical term for it is uh, is distributed ledger but we commonly know it as blockchain, and we can parse that out a bit more. Uh, aspect of Web3, which is the technology. But it's also, uh, Web3 is about not uh, having uh, sort of state actors or centralized companies, etc., own your data or dictate uh, decisions are made. Uh, it's, it's also sort of uh, where people are starting to think more about uh, economic equity throughout the world, where people who are unbanked might have access to fin financial resources, et cetera. So it's it's both the combination of the technology and the culture, and together the umbrella catch-all term for it is Web3. I gotcha. And, and I think we see a lot of this when people start talking about kind of the stranglehold that um, maybe Facebook or, you know, some of these other bigger companies, Google, you know, have over the flow of information, right? So a lot of people get their news off of social sites like Facebook or, you know, the majority of the world uses Google as their search engine. And so it's like, well, if if, if Google isn't always a good actor, and I'm not going to get into that. I don't think that's necessarily... Uh, I don't want to start a pissing match, I guess is what I'm saying. But, you know, yeah. then, then if it's decentralized, then it's like, look, then anybody who ought to be a player can be a player, right? And we don't have to worry about whether or not Google or anybody else is playing nicely now or in the future. Exactly. You know, one of the, the main tenets of Web3 technologies in general is about for you to be in control of your data, your privacy, and not essentially be marketed, uh, be a marketing, you know, 
uh, if you're right. not paying for it, then you are the product, right? And so it's uh, getting away from that and uh, trying to build a world where uh, you as have control over your own data and your own ability to things without revealing, you know, things about yourself that you may not want to reveal. Yeah, I see that as a lot of the reasons why things like VPNs are starting to become much more in vogue, right? Is because it's not only like the, the centralized endpoints, but even the centralized um, internet providers and things like that kind of make people nervous, right? It's like, I don't I don't know who can see it along the line. I don't know who else is on this Wi-Fi. I don't, you know, and so by, by opening up things up, it, it just changes the game a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm I think curious, VPNs though, are... Oh, go ahead. I said, I, I think VPNs are great, but you have to keep in mind that they, they hide the total right. digital experience, right? But there's more to uh, the, the point where you are unable to give fake information anymore. Perhaps it's a credit card mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, that. That changes everything at that point. Right. So is it is it about kind of this inherent distrust or, you know, is it about more than that? Is it because you mentioned like owning your own data? So is it about control? Is it about, I mean, what, what's the overarching concern that people have? Yeah, that's, you know, you used a good phrase there. So uh, decentralized technology, blockchain especially, is about you don't need to mm -hmm. trust anybody or anything because the data is. And you can trust that the data has been hasn't been tampered with, or with etc. I think you know you have to think about Web three uh, when you get the the bottom layer here. It's yes, concern. Uh, yes, the right to own your data is a concern. But I don't think we're there quite yet in terms of being able to have these systems built at scale where we can can assure privacy, where we can. Right assure the ability for people to control data. What we have started with right now is the very fundamental, starting to build the box of this technology and experimenting with trustlessness. That's what we are focused on right now, is can the technology be built and deployed in such a way that the cryptographic proofs that exist, et cetera, are adequate to ensure that data that you have stored can trustlessnessly, trustlessnessly be be uh, to to be un un uh, modified or untampered with. So that's mm -hmm. really the fundamental level we are working with right now. It's going up from there as applications scale up. So, I, I kind of want to just make sure that Steve or AJ don't have other things that they want to add to this before we uh, start talking about like how it's actually how it actually comes together because I, I think sort of these fundamental cultural ideas are important to what web3 is and if we don't understand those then we we don't really understand what we're trying to build so I'm, i know you know as i was listening to you i'm i'm not you know i haven't really studied the blockchain and and the in the little pieces of the technology that are involved in in web3 uh but i i'm just thinking of times in the past where I've heard podcasts or read blog posts or, you know, any other information out there about people attempting to decentralize the web. You know, there's always some new, uh, not necessarily a paradigm, but, you know, mm -hmm. network that somebody's working on or some other way that, that people are going to quote unquote decentralize the web and help get away from all these walled gardens that we find ourselves dealing with. So I'll have to say that, um, I'll believe it when I see it. I tend to be pretty skeptical of things like this. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, how it works and maybe try to understand it a little better. But uh, I, I, when something, I actually see something functioning, then I'll believe it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I think you have reason to be skeptical because uh, the technology is not yet available uh, at scale. And uh, while the technology works the the problem is that we haven't done uh, as as a community at large we haven't done a good job with the user experience which is most people haven't experienced it the way uh in a way that they can and the way they can believe it and they can 
really take advantage of, of the, the technology. Pragmatist, I don't believe that decentralized uh, technologies are going to replace everything. I think they are sort of an evolution of where we are. And there are a very specific set of problems and challenges that they are a great solution, but they aren't a solution for, for everything. And we may or may not evolve the technology is fast enough and scalable enough where it can potentially replace, which works very well, but it has its problems. Like all technologies come with some set. Of problems. Uh, and uh, so I'm very optimistic though, that for the types of problems that we're trying uh, to solve, uh, it it is already uh, working very well. So you express like you know the ability of replace web two. I I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. There is a specific set of people or entities that could benefit from uh, a web presence that cannot be shut down by authorities, for example, or dictators mm -hmm. or or you know bad regimes. So decentralized storage. Uh, IPFS, which is an overblown acronym for Intel system. Uh, it's just a decentralized storage system. There's also uh, one called, and it's called RV. Those are some of the, the popular ones. They make it possible for you to essentially have a website, just like you would on Web2, uh, except that you cannot shut it down because it is basically decentralized on so many different nodes that you can shut one down, but there's many others still available. So uh who live in in you know the 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 united states for example have freedoms etc it's very easy to be complacent about, oh yeah uh, you know you have your isp you pay them money and you have your website and they but in other places it's really hard to have that kind of capability and hard to message out uh, uh and the truth you know about what's really happening uh, without censorship, et cetera. And those are some important use that oh, that's we need to, to believe provide for. You know, one of the, I guess one of the, the analogies that comes to mind, you know, takes me back to days of Napster and then LimeWire and some of the other, you know, music downloading things back when that was first coming in where you had you know, different copies of a file all over the place and you sort of downloaded pieces and generated your own, you know, MP3 file, which was at the time back then. Is that similar to what we're talking about with Web3 or is that just the same idea, just with a totally different implementation? So you uh, mean like BitTorrent? But... Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, th there's similar so differences. Uh, what those uh, protocols did was essentially allow streaming uh, from multiple nodes simultaneously to address uh, the bandwidth available with multiple nodes, especially with home. You don't have a lot of upstream bandwidth, right? So by doing that in parallel, where you get chunks of data from many different locations at the same time, uh, it addressed. So it, it, was, it was designed to address uh, both the storage problem and also the, the bandwidth problem. But decentralized is about a slightly different kind of focus. It's about mm -hmm. making sure that there's availability of a certain asset, whether it's media or text or whatever, and you cannot shut it down. So while the while can take advantage, the protocol might take advantage of multiple nodes being available, the most important thing is availability. Also, the ability for the network nodes to validate that data has not been tampered with on Napster, for example, you couldn't if a file named a certain thing actually contained some malicious payload, right? There's no. But in decentralized networks, because of the cryptographic underpinnings of it, you can be, you can cryptographically verify that nothing. That is, I think, a very, very important aspect of the protocols. So I've, I, can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I've missed part of this discussion, but. I'm going to butt in there because of what's happened with OpenSea. Uh, okay, yeah, given that you actually know a key, which no one does, then you can verify that something came from a particular key. However, look at what's happened with OpenSea. People go steal other people's work, they sign it with their key, they collect the money, and they're selling 
caches of pictures that they didn't make, they didn't produce, they don't own, and there's no legal recourse for it because they technically didn't actually sell anything that was copywritten because they sold a hash with a picture. So I, and also we pretend that IPFS just exists out in the ether among the interplanetary system network. Um, but it turns out that there's only one planet with internet. And it also turns out that those hard drives have to exist somewhere. And if you're not the, if you're not paying, then you're the product. So who are these people that are storing all this data? What reliability guarantees would I possibly hope to have? And why are they incentivized to host it? Yeah. A few questions there. So let's break it down. We'll start with the OpenSea uh, issue. OpenSea is first of all a centralized marketplace. It's not a decentralized marketplace. And therefore it comes with all the problems as marketplaces have in general. It is subject to, to uh, scammers. It is subject to all kinds of malicious things. It, it does not change the fact the actual assets on chain, they are subject to the same cryptographic integrity as any. Now, yeah, but if what I'm saying is you can upload a virus to you can verify its cryptographic integrity, that doesn't make it not a virus. Sure. And download a virus, then that would be great. But if I didn't, uh, I, I would want to make sure that I knew who the person or the persons were and could verify the on-chain rep before I downloaded that. So uh, I, 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 I agree. Relating two issues. Uh, okay, fair, fair, fair. Yeah, I, I want to derail us back to the topic at hand, though, um, because this is like verifying files and things like that. And what we're talking about is kind of this decentralized uh, web apparatus that we're going to build apps on, right? So my question is, is, you know, you said this is a good thing for some use cases, but not others, right? And so I'm, I'm curious, like where, because we kind of went to the Napster example, you know, and, and BitTorrent and things like that, but that's not really what we're talking about. So what is a good use case for this? Like, where are we looking at and going, all right, this makes a lot of sense for, um, you know, for Web3 and what we're offering here. Sure. Uh, there's there's uh, a, quite a few different applications. There's some in the domain of DeFi, decentralized finance. I think I'd like to use one in the domain of uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, because it's some something that most people have heard about. They may not actually understand mm -hmm. it. So, so let's say that you have uh, a digital asset that's uh, actually... I don't want to get into what's valuable and what's not, but let's assume that there is a digital asset. There. Like a podcast episode. A podcast episode. Fantastic. It's like the, the, the premiere one or some, some amazing thing. And it is available as a digital asset. And it is mm -hmm. extremely valuable. Let's say dollars. Many people want to claim ownership of it and have a, like a stake in it, but they can't. So one of the ways in orchestrate a smart contract with that digital asset is to have fractional ownership. So multiple people can have on-chain uh, cryptographically uh, verified through their private keys. And you could say that, well, I can just do that by having, you know, uh, a, a Web2 application with, uh, you know, maybe a DocuSign or something like that where everyone has signed it and that's great. Now, the, the problem there is, is transfer of ownership and also who controls that particular asset. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, this fractional ownership, what you could do is set up a smart contract and you say something like if 60% of people vote a certain way, then the transfer it. Otherwise, uh, we'll hold on to it. As a very simple point there. Uh, individually, each of those fractions, and maybe you, you know it's a million dollars and you into a thousand fractions, each of those could independently anytime they wanted to without consulting the others. It doesn't matter. It's just transferring the ownership of the asset over. So that's a very simple use case where on-chain, without relying on any internal uh, entities, without having any kind of storage, it just works because of the cryptographic integrity that smart contracts uh, allow, allow you to. So that's one thing. Of course, the canonical example is cryptocurrency, but um, I know that that could get, could get political and get into like what's the advantage of fiat, et cetera. But I think 
ownership of digital assets is a pretty good, uh, mm-hmm. pretty good. Uh, other other simpler examples are where let's say that there's a band and an NFT, and that NFT is sim- nothing more than support for. But also, if you happen to show up at their concert or whatever, just by virtue of having that, you get some swag or you get upgraded, you get backstage passes or, or something like that, where, yes, you could have that exact same thing available, uh, maybe Ticketmaster or something like that. But this is the, the challenge there. You, And one of the big challenges in, in tickets, for example, with concerts is, is uh, you don't know uh, if it's authentic or or not, if you're transferring or buying it from someone else, and, and that's that's a huge problem. That problem goes away when you have as access tokens for digital events. So, uh, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, I'm a pragmatist, and I believe that with Web two technologies, you can always build in enough layers to to enforce the kind of security you have uh, natively with blockchain. That that is a hundred percent given. But when the technology exists to simple do this at scale. And just in a simple way, using open tools, you have mm-hmm. to pause and think like, what is better? You know, solutions every single time or an open solution for everybody? You're giving an example of a ticket, though. That is something that is centralized. It's issued by a ticketing authority. It, and I don't, smart contract helps that. Well, uh, like I said, like let's do it, right? People go to StubHub and sell. StubHub takes a cut. Uh, when you buy from there, you do not know if it's authentic code or a barcode or something like that. You hope that it's authentic. You won't find out until you go to the turnstile. Uh, but with a smart contract, the central authority that issues those uh, uh, tickets, they would issue them as and they are fraud proof they cannot be tampered with they are always going to be authentic know if it's been redeemed or not when you transfer it there is no middleman to work you just transfer it and you're done you don't need anyone uh to of the price well right because the so the issuance is on the ledger of the ticket correct Mm -hmm. and then the transfer of the ticket is also on the ledger so you can verify it every step of the way Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if StubHub was selling the tickets, they could have a to do this as yeah, well. As I though. S- find ways to right. to build. build. I mean, I, I guess, I guess, if it was, if it was, if the that did exist. And it was cheap to do, which my understanding is that smart contracts are, you lose value every time you take an action because there's a gas price. And so if you, the ticket was originally $99, but then you sell it to someone, then that the smart contract reaps a cut. And then if they trade it to someone else, the smart contract reaps a cut. So I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, that's actually incorrect. It. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Yeah, I, 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 I will correct that. But before that, you know, I want to, I understand everyone who is skeptical about decentralized technologies. I get it. Let me put you into that mind frame when MongoDB coming uh, into prominence. Everyone said, Doc, these are stupid. Why would anyone want that? You know, SQL works just great. And, and it is pervasive. It is everywhere because people figured out there are certain use cases where that technology, document-centric databases, work really well. They work well, especially for, for social media applications, et cetera, where you don't have to subqueries to return a set of data. So this is exactly how we need to approach decentralized technology. I don't expect everyone to believe it or, or, or even to care about it, but it is a technology, it is there, and it is going to stick around. The question is, will you just continue to be skeptical or will you dive a little bit into it and explore some of the use cases? So, 
I, you know, I'd, I'd go with Steve on this you. one. Yeah. Show me, show me a use case where, so the, the metrics are more convenient, uh, cheaper, or more performant, right? So for, for something mm -hmm. to, to take hold true, now there is the, the hype cycle, the fads, the fashion yeah. type of things that defy those, right? But typically, well, people buy health, wealth, and status. That's what people buy. So the status one can just take all sorts of forms and it doesn't obey the regular rules. But most, most things, for a technical advantage to take place, it has to be significantly cheaper, significantly more convenient, or significantly more performant. So if you, if you look at, you know, show me a use case where this is not a Rube Goldberg machine. Show me a use case sure. where it's significant, something better, where you could, you, you know, it's clear, it's easy to say, oh, no, we don't just need to tweak StubHub a little and add an extra check, but that, oh, this, oh, we, we, we'd save on costs, we'd delight customers, et cetera. from a perspective where we have access to any bank we want anytime large portion of the world that's unbanked cross-border finance is huge for them that is only possible with cryptocurrency there's a use case that is right now in countries where people are using cryptocurrency as their means of moving and storing their their income that's that's one the Collectibles have always been there. We've had baseball cards, we've had stamps, we've had coins, all kinds of collectibles. We are moving them to realm now and making them much more accessible to people at scale where you can trade, where you can uh, get their value easily, you can easily. So if, if baseball cards have been around for a while, take those and they have our hobby, and we've made them digital and more secure. Why is that a bad thing? So one area that uh, I'm just going to derail us again, because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my thing. Uh, so the term is re-rail us, Chuck, we got derailed. Re-rail us. Well, I, I, I mean, I, the, it's definitely interesting, you know, kind of the, the use cases that we're talking through here. Um, one thing that I'm a little curious about is, okay, so, you know, we're talking about the use case in the sense of, you know, I own an asset and I want to use the asset. I guess my other question, you know, as we kind of dive into this a little bit is, as a developer, right, how, how does this affect me when I'm starting to look at some of these applications and say, okay, you know, maybe, yeah, decentralized banking or decentralized assets of some kind, right? You know, maybe it's decentralized. Um, no, you have some way of, of notarizing ownership of something, right? That That's in the physical world, you know? So yep. what does that begin to look like for, you know, for, for me as a developer building an app where that's something that, you know, I'm working on? Great. I think I'd like to answer that by first kind of describing the, the, the lay of the land for code looks like in the world of blockchains, because I'm not sure mm -hmm. that everyone to uh, well yet un might understand that. So when we say smart contracts, l let's just be clear, they're n neither smart nor contracts. They're just basically applications. Uh, they just had the term smart contracts. That so Many blockchains have the ability to code. Uh, they do it via a virtual machine. The most popular of them is the Ethereum mm -hmm. virtual machine. So as the name suggests, it is literally a virtual. And it has a programming language called Solidity. And it's got a couple of others also. And what these uh, EVMs do is essentially take code that has been created and deployed on the blockchain. Uh, it and the result of it might change the state of the blockchain and that, that blockchain data. So a couple of things, the code that uh, you run, the, the application is immutable. Deployed it to the blockchain, it can never be changed. That's where the, the contract thing comes from. It's a contract in code. Uh, 
because in typical programs today, you find a bug, you uh, fix the bug, you push out a new release, and boom, you got the fix out there, new version, problem solved. With with blockchain uh, applications, uh, much more deliberate uh, because uh, any code you put there is immutable. It's there forever. So that code, when it executes, it manipulates data. That data is in that same application. So we are used to the concept of application logic and data being sort of separate. Data is typically in a database uh, and your application logic is running maybe on your API server or something like that. In a smart contract, both the, the and the data that manip the, the, the code manipulates that data. It's all uh, so that's what we are talking about when it comes to to contracts. How does that actually work? Well, there are functions just like you would have in C sharp or whatever. There are functions, and uh, an external entity, uh, uh, a person or a program, can call. Uh, the a remote procedure call into the blockchain node. Node. So let's say that there's a Ethereum blockchain and it has 500 nodes. You can pick any node you access the contract address where and call that particular function with whatever parameters. And you, if that contract function executes successfully, and maybe it has a value of x equal wanted x to be incremented by one, then x will now change to one. About blockchain programs and smart, uh, smart contracts, uh, they are, the data in them is always free to read. You can read it as much as you want infinitely. But whenever you want to change it on the blockchain, regardless of what you're doing, it doesn't matter if it's with your program or you're, you're just moving uh, funds between two accounts. Anytime you change the, the blockchain, you have to pay for that, and that is commonly called a uh, gas. Now, in our world, which we live in the, the current world of Web2, that someone else. When you use Gmail, you never think about paying for it because Google's paying for it. They make their mm -hmm. money elsewhere. Here in the decentralized world, the node independent operators. And so they are, you have to pay for that computing resource. And that's what gas boils down to. Now, uh, and it is like, oh God, everything is very expensive. Yes, it is because it, there the is going through an evolution. The the first uh, sort of wave actually was the first one used a technology called proof of work, where your computer were essentially adding the blocks to the blockchain. It's done through a process of mining, simplistically. Um, that required them to solve complex mathematical problems, which came from. But people realize very quickly that that is not a long. So we have since moved to something called proof of stake, where people actually stake money, have the right to do that, which uh, now the cost uh, of it. And then you running your computer for browsing or watching a video or whatever it is, is no different at all. But because the narrative of proof of work is just much more exciting, using energy and using depleting the plant's resources and all that, that's the narrative that the media continues to hang on to, whereas that is first generation technology. So proof of stake is where things are. Now, that brings us to the cost of, of gas. So because of the, the way the protocols work, the early Ethereum protocol, et cetera, uh, there, there was a substantial cost to these. That is changing. If you look at blockchains, like I'll just throw people like Solana, Avalanche, Polygon, et cetera, the cost of these transactions is minuscule, like one thousandth of a penny times for for a transaction. So even that is evolving very rapidly to the point where the cost will start getting low very quickly and then start really being adopted by mainstream. So I hope I hope I answered some of your questions there about applications. I think you did. I'm trying to envision like um as far as like cost and stuff right so yeah. you know we yeah hopefully we start seeing it get to the point where people are going wow this is a really viable way for me to get my computing done and it's a really simple way of sharing the data um i'm imagining that um because yeah some of these we're talking about like nfts or keeping track of 
you know, smart contracts where, you know, it's like I'm transferring ownership of this to that or doing things like that. Um, I'm imagining also, you know, things like, you know, maybe social networks or things like that, right? Where, uh, you know, again, you know, the, the, your past chain of posts is immutable or, you know, maybe there is some kind of, uh, you know, deletion or encryption or something like that, I guess. I don't know how realistic that is, but we'll set that aside. So, you know, so I build this Web3 application where essentially when I post, you know, it, it, it does that work on the other end. And then, yeah, I can just go read it off of the, the blockchain and post it to my site. So it's all decentralized. The, the issue that I'm curious about is we've seen other things, you know, um, social media like Twitter and Facebook. I remember during like Arab Spring and stuff, you know, people were saying, well, anybody could post to it. And so it helped all these movements and things like that. And again, not passing any value judgments. I know there are political concerns there, right? But um, eventually they, it, it became much more centralized, right? And so now we have claims of censorship and things like that. Again, I'm not getting political on this, but within Twitter and Facebook, right? They're taking down posts that they, you know, mm -hmm. about things they don't agree with. And, you know, they're, they're closing accounts for violating their terms, which, you know, some people agree with and some people don't. And so I imagine that this blockchain kind of solves some of those issues but if I own the blockchain or I'm the one that is writing those contracts, would it just become another centralized place where I'm just storing it in a fancy way? Uh, yeah, if 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 no one checks that smart contract code and sees that you've done that. One of the beauties of public blockchains and smart contracts is all the code is available for everyone to look at. Okay. So if you see code that has those characteristics, you would say like, well, this is use it so uh, this is related maybe just tangentially maybe not as much as i think but what about though i don't remember what social networks they were but basically there were some decentralized social networks and they just started i, I guess looking at root nodes and figuring out which clients were coming from a particular sub network and then blocking people and then blocking anyone that didn't have those networks in their block list. I, I want to say it started with a G. I don't remember what it what it was, but um, there was that happened last last year, a, a quote unquote, decentralized network started censoring people too. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're talking, I know Mastodon, you can federate between social networks. And I don't know if you can disallow people from other networks. Well, they, they basically just kind of made a pact of to because oh, the way that the the decent and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick here. But the way that the the blockchains work is on a concept of a distributed hash table, and a distributed hash table is a fancy way of saying you ship the authority with the code. So you when you download the code, the code has the distributed hash table root nodes in it, and then you contact those root nodes, and then it gives you other nodes, and each node could create a blacklist and just say, hey, oh, we're not gonna allow th these nodes. So people don't, everything has a source of truth. There is no such thing as truly decentralized because you have to reach out somewhere to start the conversation and it has to be a known entity. And so I'm not clear on the technical details of this, but what I think happened was some of the root nodes and the secondary nodes just kind of made a pact together that they were going to share a blacklist of nodes that participated in networks that a certain client used. And then they started telling other people, if you don't adopt our blacklist for your nodes and your, your hash table, then we're going to put you on our blacklist. And so oh, they started, they started, uh, central it wasn't really centralization it was it was group consensus it was majority vote which is is what a blockchain is essentially but they were able to so which are uh one of the the core premises of the decentralized networks is to protect against something that we call the 51 percent attack we mm -hmm. have sort of a majority of the nodes just uh, you know, make a decision and then essentially cause uh, havoc. So uh, 
product engineer and and uh, I don't know enough about the you know workings of of product. but that those are the kinds of things that larger scale more like ethereum solana etc have addressed really well so if there is uh, some if someone has created a protocol uh, you know what we call an l1 chain uh, and it's a standalone entity whose purpose is run a social network etc and if they have not engineered that protocol well to handle the security uh, and uh, make it susceptible to 51% attacks then i can scenario you describe manifest itself um, well the on the larger public chains this is something that is butter you have to have protected against it uh, you you do have the potential uh, forks to happen that's when you know a majority of sort of the start veering off on a different uh, mm -hmm. using a different blockchain so that that has not happened or and is not foreseeable to happen for a on the public like the public chains but you're going to have smaller chains with fewer nodes where for all practical purposes they are no more different than a server farm in in a web2 world so in that case yeah i mean people can do talking about but i i i, I have those things take the limelight away you know from the majority of the public protocols have been designed to be secure against those 51% Cool. So I, I guess one thing that I'm wondering about is this is a JavaScript show, right? And you're writing this stuff in Solidity. Yep. I'm assuming the NPC calls have, you know, it's JavaScript or whatever, right? You just HTTP call or something. Um, I mean, why would I want to get into this, right? Because most of the web just it just functions, you know, kind of the yeah. way that it always has. So why do I, why would I want this? And then the other question I'm asking in a minute is how. Yep, great question. So you know, in the world of web development, you have front end developers, you have back end developers, mm -hmm. and you have full stack uh, kind of developers. This is no different than that. If you are going to write smart contracts, you can. The analogy is you're a back end developer. You're working with APIs, databases, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You're working uh, in the world of blockchain. Let's say it's Ethereum. You're working with Solidity. If it's a, working with Cadence, if it's Solana, you're working with Rust. This is a mm -hmm. developer with specialized skills and experience of uh, understanding the new programming paradigm. I'll give you a simple example. When we program in C Sharp, uh, Java, JavaScript, whatever, we are rarely thinking of the cost per line of execution. Uh, you know, 20 lines, 50 lines, don't don't think too much about it. Mm -hmm. track. Every execution, every every operation there. So you write really tight code and you use a concept called fail fast. You want to make sure you check puts and all that. Not not at the point where you're gonna use them in your code, you check them all up fail immediately so that there's no so all of that in a nutshell, is highly specialized. So if you are going to go down that path, it's because you're choosing to. There is no requirement that everyone who builds decentralized apps be a contract developer. In fact, uh, 70 to 80% of developers for decentralized apps already have all the skills they need. JavaScript, HTML, CSS, know how to use NPM install and the library associated with the particular block. For example, with Ethereum, the libraries are Web3.js or Ethers.js. Take your pick, either one of those. In fact, there's even a framework called Hardhack. You work with all JavaScript, nothing to do with anything like that. You literally are writing JavaScript functions. So uh, for, for, for JavaScript developers, Web3 represents a green field of opportunity, like really amazing uh, applications you can build there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot, lot of money, honestly, from your standpoint to be made uh, with just taking your skills and learning one of these, not learning a new language at all, but learning how decentralized apps function. Is a, for a competent JavaScript developer about an hour. Okay.
So it sounds like, yeah, I, I probably have most of the skills that I'm going to want or need in order to pick this up, right? So I can pick it up rather quickly. I guess the other question I have is, is I mean, most people, if they're looking for jobs, they're looking for jobs based on some kind of demand curve. And you're, mm -hmm. you're talking like there's a lot of demand out there for this kind of work. Um, how do I figure that out and how do I find those jobs? Yeah, I mean, uh, a, a large number of the jobs, right, domains, creating decentralized finance applications and creating NF. Those are super, super um, high in, in demand. And uh, if you just Google, you know, um, uh, crypto and uh, a developer, I think uh, you should be able to find it on the usual sites, you know, or usual job sites. Uh, they are available. The, the thing, though, uh, is with decentralized technologies and, and Web3 in particular, it's, about about how it's not just about the technology, it's about the culture. So I think right. when you talk about jobs, this might be an opportune uh, talk about uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, more than as time passes, like let's say, you know, we are in 2023, 2024, most people who are just entering into the Web3 space are going not for a company, but are going to work for a DAO. So a DAO is is really a, a company, but with its governance model, etc., cetera, a contract. So uh, instead of having a board of directors, it is more uh, governance is handled by the members of the DAO. Uh, a, a closer analogy would be something like a collective or an HOA or something like that, where you know it's it's about the the people who are part of a community uh, by birth owning tokens in that community they have uh, votes in uh, in what the that community does so you could as a member of the community propose an action or a change in how the community works the other members vote vote on it and then how the the community functions so more and more DAOs are where uh, people go to do work. So if you're a designer, you might go work for a DAO and for a programmer, you might do that. So there are there are special purpose DAOs being uh, created for uh, content creators. There's now uh, one of the for DAO, which is growing very, very uh, fast. And in fact, at the end of February, they will have their first conference uh, and a large number of those developers are JavaScript developers. So uh, that, that's where I think a lot of the career growth is going to come to centralized companies making blockchain applications. Okay, so color me confused and skeptical at the same time. I'm confused. So if I'm a developer and I'm working for this DAO, how is my day to day different than than working for a company? Uh, uh, you're I work for a DAO, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so you're you right. So I do work for Dash, Dash Incubator, which is a, a DAO. I recently learned this because to me, it's, uh, you know, kind of money in, hours out kind of thing. I you recently work, learned that you're working for a DAO or you recently learned about DAOs? I recently learned that it is it is called a DAO. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Because so the the way that it works is there are proposals at least in the different DAOs can have different ways of organizing things, but there are proposals and there are stakeholders and stakeholders um, essentially it, it's not it so it's not all Ethereum smart contracts. There's other stuff as well. And Dash has its own way of doing its quote unquote smart contract slash voting system. But basically proposals go up, they get assigned a manager. The manager assigns a bounty for specific tasks within the proposal. Then developers request to take on the task. Then when the task is completed, the manager signs off on it and then the bounty is claimed and issued from the uh, voter node pool. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it right. Uh, Ryan will probably kill me once he listens to this episode. But, <laughs> but 
but that's that my experience with it is Ryan and I have a conversation. He makes sure that a task gets put up on a list with a bounty associated with it. And then he makes sure that I get paid to my dash address and then I can cash out in US dollars or eat it Outback Steakhouse because uh, they now have a MasterCard and a, a gift card system called Dash Direct and all this stuff. So it, it actually, and Dash is a little bit different than the other ones because Dash is digital cash. If you go on their website, there's no mention of blockchain or cryptocurrency. They're very much marketed towards Here's a technology that happens to exist. We're trying to figure out how to make it easier for people to do digital money. It's not necessarily the blockchain religion. It's just somebody created blockchain stuff. They're trying to take advantage of it. And a lot of the work is related to that end. So the things that I am working on are management tools and also merchant tools so that it's easier for merchants to transact digital money. So it is somewhat self-serving in the sense of uh, some people have given it the criticism of a company script because you're working for the company that's job is to produce uh, the ability to transact this money and you're given this money as payment for the work that you do. But so you, you, so you there's this list of that. work that has to be done and you say, hey, I want to do this project and there's a predetermined amount that you get paid for completing such a task and then you get paid for it in digital money or uh monopoly money however you've determined yep. to get paid is that right well it's certainly not monopoly money it is i know i'm just throwing money. yeah i know i know yeah. i'm just throwing in terms uh, th that is one one uh, you actually you described it very accurately i mean there's bounties you can it's think of it like the gig economy right like you can take that on but then there are DAOs where uh which are a little more mature which have gone beyond uh, simple tasks. Ooh, where... gloves thrown down. <laughs> hmm? uh, just saying that there are DAOs that are a little more mature. Well, Technically, yeah, Dash mean... is the very first DAO, so it would actually be the most mature. But anyway, uh, oh, go ahead. I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but what, 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 uh, about the maturity of the DAO, but the maturity of its model, where they that for certain com complex tasks, you can't have ad hoc developers do continuity. It requires experience, etc. In which case, uh, a working group or a, a guild, uh, there are different names uh, of a full-time role and you draw a full-time salary. Might be uh, typically in either USDC, which is a stable coin, the equivalent of uh, one US dollar for each USDC, or it might be uh, in tokens, or it might be Ethereum, depending on what that the model of that particular uh, DAO is. But ultimately, it comes down to the, the fact that you are not contractually bound to only work for one DAO. You can be working concurrently with it at your own pace, at your own schedule, at your own location, however you want. So, How's that different than standard um, freelancing? Uh, the... the, the, the is that standard freelancing requires you to be uh, upfront about uh, sort of uh, marketing. You, you need to go and sell yourself and promote yourself and find your next gig, etc. Here with DAOs, the gigs are, are available, easier to find, and you don't have to limit yourself to one particular DAO. You can choose the skills you want to apply and work on them. So yeah, in a sense, it's similar without the, the need to constantly have to mark there's so how is this tied back to web 3 then i guess is where i'm confusing i mean it's to me it, i mean what you're explaining sounds like a uh, a business model sure it's, it's maybe slightly different from freelancing or a standard company it's just another variation but i'm curious i'm trying to understand how this ties back to web 3 and blockchain and, and all the other stuff we've been talking about fantastic question so the DAOs are have emerged and in order to that we live in a world where in companies, uh, a very few people make all the decisions and a very few people benefit from the productivity of a very large number of people in that organization. Your average person does not get the same benefit as say the CEO or the board of directors, et cetera, whereas they are doing all the work. DAOs are about democratizing the workforce and making it so that boards for shared labor. Uh, and uh, it, it's all um, 
a set of rules and governance where you uh, as a person working in an have a say in what that entity does more than you would uh you parallel is stock ownership but stock owners for example have very little say you can show up at you know mm -hmm. a, 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 a meeting or as individuals your vote doesn't matter too much but in doubt individual votes matter you can also delegate them to who you trust uh, so it's it's way more flexible and it's also governed through small so it's all open and transparent there are you can do shenanigans okay but um, there's still there's sorry chuck one more thing um there's still you got to have a manager right you're talking to a manager you got to have somebody that puts the work together and decides you know what's the work to be done what's the bounty for this and so on right and yeah. I would think at somewhere you got to have a at some point you got to have an ultimate point of decision making just because you know based on personal experience and what i've watched whether you want to go back to the uh infamous occupy wall street or any of those type of organizations where everybody tries to go by consensus that didn't work you need a final authority in some cases so i'm curious to see where that fits in these DAOs. uh, uh within DAOs, uh you can have uh you can Groups, you can have guilds, etc. Those can have leaders. You can a, a core group of leaders. The, the the key thing to understand here, Steve, is that it's open and so everybody is aware of what's going on, and there it isn't some of the closed room decision making, the nepotism, all of that. It's much, much, much harder to do because it's transparent and and open. That's the difference. And ultimately, uh, you know, this is designed for a generation of people, et cetera, that are really disgruntled with how uh, life in general has been to them. It's really hard for them to, uh, to f their career prospects are not super bright. Uh, they, but uh, we value experience more than, you know, and passion and the ability to want to dive into something and just learn those kind of things are not valued uh in in companies uh, harder to get a break and DAOs give especially young people i think the opportunity to start exploring different things while finding their their niche and finding their passion and in building experience so uh DAOs won't replace everything not in but they are an ongoing experiment. They are a new experiment in this in this laboratory of, of uh, sort of uh, business. Um, it's it's a new way to conduct business, and I feel like especially for information centric businesses, DAOs are a great way to go. Uh, the jury is completely with DAOs if you, for example, choose a model where the company is manufacturing or something like that. But you have to look at it as an experiment. It's a work in progress. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing is that the DAO itself, like AJ explained how the DAO that he's working for works, but they, I mean, they can adopt whatever governance model they want. And then the, what I'm understanding is, is that any changes to the government governance model may then necessitate a change to the smart contracts that they use to govern the DAO, right? And so then when I vote or you vote or whoever votes, you know, that's all governed by smart contract at that point, right? So we changed the structure by changing the contract, which we all voted on using the smart contracts in the first place. And then all of this is saved to the ledger and it's all transparent. And at the same time, if I buy into the DAO, you know, if, so if I buy somebody else's um, token, right and so i can vote or i buy uh, enough of the tokens so that i can vote you know so many times however it's structured right again you know maybe i buy six tokens but it still only affords me one vote that's all just built into how it runs then it's all open and transparent i can see what's happening i can see how the decisions are being made all of the voting and everything else happens in an open way where everybody can see what's going on and it's all audited publicly i I can see where some companies may want to make private decisions, like if they want to buy and negotiate on real estate or something like that, you know, if the Dow needs to buy an office. You know, I could see those kinds of things being something that they have to figure out and negotiate within their structure. 
but the rest of it, it yeah, it, it seems that at the end of the day, um, the rest of that stuff all just gets handled on the DAO. And then, you know, maybe, yeah, if there is some kind of privileged information that needs to be managed, you know, you put some kind of smart contract on that where it's encrypted maybe for a certain amount of time or things like that until, you know, until, yeah, it becomes open or however you manage that. But it's all, you can see how it all runs because it's it's all managed, you know, it's uh, in that decentralized manner. And then you set up the smart contracts to facilitate the actual business. Yep. That's a beautiful and very accurate summation. Yeah. And I could definitely, I, I mean, I could come up with things that I think are probably drawbacks to it. I can also see that there yep. are certain advantages to it, right? Where you, everybody kind of knows what's going on and, and, and how and why, you know, and, and maybe you issue more, uh, you know, so you have a certain level of tokens that are there and then maybe you have a mm -hmm. cryptocurrency that's also on the same blockchain that, you know, that's how people get paid or, I mean, there are lots of, it, it seems like it opens up a lot of possibilities, which. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you one of the drawbacks, uh, which DAOs are now, is this idea that, you know, you have whales, meaning, you know, wealthy people who own mm -hmm. a lot of the tokens. Well, they'll have a disproportionately large votes that's where things mm -hmm. go we don't want that that's not desirable so DAOs are responding with having models where there's for example quadratic voting where each subsequent vote based on your tokens requires more and more tokens so you get to the point where all your millions of tokens etc will still uh be a sizable amount of vote another thing they're experimenting is voting so for example if the vote is about uh uh marketing then your vote carries more weight than someone who's mm -hmm. not a marketer you know that kind of stuff etc so there's lots of these exciting experiments being it's not perfect it's not even good yet but i can tell you it's very very exciting because we get seeing a, a human experiment that's in business models in real time you're a participant in it you know it's so much fun it's kind of like being there in the early days when maybe the stock exchanges were being that what were the decisions being made how did they come up with you know a sequel or whatever all those kind of things this it's just so exciting to be part of this movement to participate and know that well some of these ideas are going to just bomb terribly they're going to fail some of them are going to be just awesome and that that's what excites me well, and tying this back to Web3, because we kind of went on DAOs and NFTs and all this stuff, right? Um, but it's... The... It's all about, yeah. Yeah. Web3 is just anything that is is related to a blockchain or a cryptocurrency. Yeah. For, for me, if I'm going back to just building apps, right? You know, kind of the yeah. thing that we do on the web right now. That's That's where this gets kind of interesting, because I think there are going to be some applications that eventually blockchain is the way or web three is the way that they materialize you know it just won't make sense once we figure some of this stuff out to do it any other way and so if you're getting into it now if you're interested in it now it seems like a terrific direction to go in uh just keep in mind that yeah it's still early so some of it yeah we're still waiting through some of the garbage that we're gonna have to wade through on this stuff but it I, I think understanding it early is also going to be beneficial to a lot of people. Yep. Uh, and, you know, that's what I'm working on with my company, Decentology. We are built for Web2 developers. And our basic thesis is that most Web2 developers don't want to learn smart contract programming. And nope. we want to make it as easy as NPM for them. Mm -hmm. So with the Hyperverse, what we are doing is we are essentially having developers build these blockchain primitives if you want to call it them uh we call them smart so uh, instead of having like monolithic smart con things we'll have smart contracts that do one thing really well and what web developers can do is using our react based front end javascript libraries wire up all these different smart modules kind of like lego blocks and orchestrate your decentralized app and not only that you can make hype combination of web 2 and web 3 apps so maybe only one aspect of your app needs to be web 3 great you know build a web 2 app and just add this web 3 so so 
this, uh, we are blockchain agnostic, so we're going to work across all major blockchains eventually. And with with the Hyperverse, you know, it'll be like NPM install, just like that. It'll be Hyperverse install. Pick the module you want, like NFT. Add that you you've got, and then import it in. Good to go. So, how could you possibly be blockchain agnostic? Because they're they're highly highly specific algorithmic protocols. Uh, so it seems like you either have to build for each of them individually or you're not really building something on a blockchain. Yep, you are You are 100% right on both counts. So but what I mean is that our specification that we have created, uh, think of it like the NPM spec, right? Package JSON, it requires you to have a certain number of fields in there with certain values. Just like that, we hyperverse smart modules and the libraries, the front end libraries conform to the spec is still evolving. We are working on it, but we are then making our available for each uh, blockchain that we support. Each of those developers will have built the custom smart modules that uh, would that. Uh, one of the things that's emerging right now is that block coming special purpose. So there's general purpose blockchains like Ethereum, but then you're there are some blockchains which are so fast that they're great for gaming, for example, or for DeFi, et cetera. Uh, you are you are right. So each blockchain will have its own unique set of smart models, but there's gonna have a they're gonna have a common look and feel, and they're gonna have a common. You can go and search and find these modules based on the blockchain you picked, and is also uh, different. But because the hyper of interface is common across them, all of them. From a programming standpoint, it doesn't matter which blockchain you're programming for, uh, the experience is the same. The developer experience is the same. Mm -hmm. So, okay, two things. One, how many different uh, competitors do you have? Because it seems that this is something everybody wants to do is to abstract all the blockchains, in which case, how do you get in a leading position to become the authority on abstracting blockchain so that people, so that you actually have real value rather than just being one of the millions of minnows? That's one. That's one. And two, if you abstract away all the blockchains, then how do you get any of the value of what they specifically offer by their differences? Yep. So we are not abstracting away blockchains because what we are doing is making sure that the hyperverse uh, library. Is, is consistent, uh, but the value proposition that we are providing is is not necessarily in, in sort of the JavaScript part of it. But anyone else can also come and provide that, that's fine. The value we are providing is in the modules, the, the smart modules that are referred to on-chain. Uh, what we are building is an open, decentralized marketplace for smart contracts. So what I mean by that is any developer who knows how to uh, program smart con a smart module and they can monetize it they can ch choose each transaction i want you know a penny or if there's a monetary value to the transaction they can say i want two percent or whatever so smart contract uh, developers can monetize it that way uh, but for the javascript developers you don't have to worry about came into existence you just need to decide if you want to use if the price of it is reasonable for you, uh, then you just use it with the Hyperverse library. Now, if you don't want to use our libraries, like the JavaScript libraries, and you want to like, well, I write my own, you can do that because it's all on chain. So the writing is not in the abstraction of it. The value we are providing it is in having a standard way in which smart built, deployed, monetized, and more importantly, secured. Things that is a big challenge with any open source is, is the code uh, secure? What if it's malicious? So we are building a community of auditors that will all audit those smart modules. Trust that the code is secure. They will stake their tokens uh, as a form of security for those modules. Uh, that sort of access and ensure and allowing anyone consuming those modules to trust it. If the module turns out to have a problem, the stake, the money put up by those auditors gets slashed. They lose it. And to whoever suffered a loss. So this is an innovative security model we are also building on the hypers.
So one thing that I'm curious about, because you know we, we've talked a whole bunch about this, it seems kind of forward looking to me to be thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to go learn how to build Web three apps, um, you know, or Web three organizations or whatever. Um, what do you see coming next that's exciting? You know, if if we're being forward thinking, right? What what's the next innovation going to be, or where does it come? I'm learning. I'm seeing every day that gaming web3 based uh gaming is huge uh if you think about the scenarios today where in-game assets are game uh nfts are completely transforming that because you can have the ability for web3 games where you can take your assets you you know you want to take it over to the other game you know uh trading uh, and uh having uh games that that uh, have a play to earn model. So during the past year or so during COVID, uh, for example, uh, Axie Infinity was a very popular game in Philippines and it gave people the ability to make a living because they would essentially play this game generating uh, in-game assets, which are v valued by other people who didn't wanna spend that much time playing to earn them and just wanted to use them. And they were willing to pay money to buy them. This is how a lot of people in the survived the pandemic you know this is web3 at, at scale solving and bringing to bringing economic equity so i think gaming is going to continue to grow and a play to x whatever that x is whether it's you know or uh, grow uh, etc or even x to earn you know different models like that are being experimented with and i'm, I'm very very um, excited about it. you see for example Dapper Labs has NBA Top Shot, where you can collect NBA moments. Uh, right now, they're just collectibles, but there is a, a, a mobile game where you can take your moments and assemble them into virtual teams. And so that's going to be exciting. That, uh, so, you know, we, we see, we, we do, do the, the, uh, the football games and stuff like that off uh, when we, we pick our teams, et cetera. But being able to do that with with and uh, that we own on chain, it's it's really exciting stuff. I'll say, as the resident skeptic, this is actually something mm -hmm. I believe is accurate. I believe that <laughs> because gaming is a self-contained universe, and if you're talking about indie gamers, so if you're talking about a big studio, they're gonna, you know, Nintendo's gonna want the eShop, Xbox is gonna want Xbox Live, etc. Right? I I don't see them switching over. Anytime soon. But if you talk about indie gamers, somebody creates a standard Unity, is it called Unity? Is that what it's called? 3D model. They create an mm -hmm. NFT for it. You have your character in one game. You transfer your character over to another game. From the developer's perspective, there's a financial incentive in it because they can put the smart contract into the character and the character being transferred can generate them income. They can build a business model around that and then they create a standard protocol to transfer assets between games with, I mean, they still have to come up with a schema for how to define the characteristics of the avatar or whatever, but I could definitely see this among indie gamers. It's a universe that exists within the internet. It doesn't require any outside interaction. It doesn't require any outside verification. It doesn't require any outside regulation, no oracles, none of that stuff, because everything began and ended in the internet space without any real physical contact beyond it. So I'm, I actually believe that that is a use case that might not have been solved any other way because the big game, big game studios would have no incentive to let you transfer trademarkable characters between universes. Congratulations, Nick. You have earned the AJ seal of approval, which is very difficult <laughs> to earn. Yay. I'm so excited. Thank you. Really, you know, I, I think your analysis was spot on. The big game studios, uh, they have no incentive to get rid of their walled gardens. And uh, yeah, with Indie, this makes a lot of sense. And actually, the, 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 the NFT standard, it's called ERC721 and another one called ERC1155, they've been baked in. They are there for a while now, and they support all the standard metadata and all of this kind of stuff already. So I... Game game uh, uh, platforms to 
kind of thing. And it's really exciting. Uh, I'm not a gamer, but there's a bunch of people on our team who are gamers, and they're about this thing. So, yeah. I think ultimately what AJ explained kind of solidified in my head what this is all about, right? Because the the big console makers, right? They're the ones with all the resources. They're the ones that benefit from a centralized infrastructure. And so they're the ones that are not going to go for this, right? And similarly, in a lot of these other places, you know, where, um, you know, I'm providing a process or, a, you know, things like that, where they either need to, or I want them to, because I benefit from it, uh, need to keep them centralized right i need to keep them where in my app where they live blah 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 right i'm not going to go for this but if i want to benefit from being part of an ecosystem where i can share push exchange and otherwise keep track of ownership uh you know location on the web you know or whatever and you know and I can make a living by allowing people to participate in my thing and participate in everyone else's thing. Those are the things that this opens up, right? And 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 it seems like that's what we're talking about here, you know, with with the different, uh, you know, the DAOs even, right? It's okay. Well, you know, do I want to be part of a centralized control? company or do i want to be part of something that's a little more democratized like a dao do i want to be part of a computing ecosystem where i share resources and and other assets among the other parts of that ecosystem or do i want people to live in my little area right and and there's nothing necessarily wrong about either approach and there're going to be pros and cons to every organization and every application depending on how they do it right some of them is just not going to make sense and some of them it really will and so that's where people are going to make that decision right it's it's i'm going to benefit more from being part of this open ecosystem than i will by ha- being behind this wall proof of stake type stuff, the indie game developers, it might make sense for them to run right. their own blockchain for essentially somewhere between 20 and a hundred dollars a month They're, to run their own node is what I meant to say to, to right. participate. Because if you want to participate in a blockchain, you're either going to be running at home and that's going to be unreliable if you're trying to provide a business service or you're going to be running it in the cloud. And if you're running it in the cloud, your bare minimum is probably looking around $20 a month. I think that's where I don't think there's any need for game developers to be concerned with the infrastructure. Let other people handle that. That's one of the beauties of the decentralized web uh, and blockchain it's in not general. Uh, centralized if you only let the if, if the only people who are participating are a very small select group of people it's not decentralized if the game developers want to get in on this and they don't participate in it you you have to pay in at some point otherwise there's no there's no guarantee that the stuff you you need will be there when you need it you know it, if something goes wrong and and people get out of this specialized in if you've got two other people that are still running it, it'll still work. But it, you have to be able to supply the demands of your users. I, anyway, I, I, I cut you off. I should, that was rude of me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll no, let you speak. No, I was going to say is, is you should pick a blockchain that is already secure. And, and you know, when I say the term secure for a blockchain, what I mean is it's got enough nodes out there with fail, uh, unlikely to be shut down. It's reasonably decentralized. 500 nodes, a thousand nodes, you pick whatever, you know, is a reasonably good number for you. And popular blockchains these days are hitting those thousands of nodes. So that makes sense. It, it, yeah, there is some risk inherent in being part of a smaller chain with fewer nodes, but at the same time, there's a right. But that uh, on the flip side, if it grows and you're an early adopter, then there are advantages to that as well. Maybe uh, the advantages would be if you uh, the native cryptocurrency of that blockchain uh, mm-hmm. at an early stage and you have you're holding right. a sizable amount of it, then. Uh, but otherwise, uh, really, what you're is the fact that the 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 platform on which you are building stronger and is getting more adoption uh, and right. that always helps
Cool. Well, we're kind of at the end of our time. Um, if people want to check out the Hyperverse you're building, where do they find all that stuff? Yeah, so uh, they can go to this.com. Uh, we are going to start our preview here in early. And all through the month of February, we'll be re releasing incremental updates. And we'll be doing a pop in March. Uh, you know, uh, I come from myself. I've been in the Microsoft ecosystem for a long time. Founder of uh, DNN, open source CMS, um, C Sharp development, et cetera. Uh, I, I also initially looked at this with a healthy amount of skepticism. And what I would encourage people to do is to not just go by what the most of those things are old and outdated. Go check out and download an SDK or something. Tinker with it for a weekend and can, and see for yourself what it's like. Skepticism is is warranted and welcome because that actually helps. So, but. I think skepticism without actually having experienced or uh, you might end up being skeptical for the wrong reasons. Be skeptical, you know? So, so check out this so let stuff. Me uh, let me clarify. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying not to believe the media? Am I understanding correctly? Just kidding. <laughs> Here so, we go. All right. Um, a few other things. You guys do a regular meetup where you talk about the Web3 stuff, right? Where, where do people get on that? Yeah, so we have a, a sort of every Thursday we have, a, a, I, I call it a blockchain chill, where people just bring their coffee or whatever and chill and we talk about Web3 uh, topics. I also do a lot of Twitter spaces. I'm at, at TechBubble on, uh, on Twitter. Where and answer web developers questions, much like what we have been uh, doing uh, today. But uh, you, you can find all that information from Decentology.com. Right. And then one last thing I just wanted to bring up is that um, I've been wanting to, for a while, uh, put out sort of a regular, like, second episode segment kind of thing about JavaScript topics. And so I, I talked to Nick and some of the other folks at Decentology because I wanted to bring in Web3. And so we're going to put out, you're going to get a Web3 topic going forward on that as well. So um, that's going to start sometime in February. Keep an eye out because, yeah, Nick and I will jump on one every month and just give you something about Web3. So um, keep an eye out for that as well. I am really looking forward to that. That's yeah, I kind of wanted to set the stage here, right? Because there is context that will help people understand what we're talking about there. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and jump into picks. AJ, do you have some picks for us? Uh, I didn't know we were doing this today. <laughs> <laughs> no Wait, problem. A I'll whip something up. All right, Steve, do you have some picks for us? I have picks. Uh, I'll just stick with the uh, the uh, <clears throat> jokes of the week. You know, Nick, this is always uh, the high point of the podcast. Chuck, Chuck just gets tons of contact letters that say we need more dad jokes. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can hear the yeah. excitement. Sure. So anyway, uh, my favorite things are eating my family and not using commas. No, everybody gets... <laughs> Took me a minute. Sorry. Yeah, you know, it's uh, punctuation yeah. matters. Punctuation matters. Yeah. Yes. So um, the other day, I beat a I beat a black belt at karate. But my next challenge is a green sock. And finally, uh, so uh, I was sitting in church the other day, and there's I was sitting next to this elderly couple, and I heard the the wife say to her husband, she goes, "I let out one of those silent farts. What do I do?" And he says, change the battery in your hearing aid. <laughs> yeah, don't laugh. It only encourages him. All right. Well, I'll jump in with my picks here real quick. So I always do a board game pick. Um, my wife's cousins and her sister and brother-in-law came over to play board games. Um on Saturday and we had a good time. Uh, one of the games that we played that my sister-in-law brought is called wavelength. 
And it's more of a party game, which really is not my speed at all. I I generally, it's like it's like oh, is this is this more or less what everybody else thinks? It's just eh, whatever. Anyway, this one was kind of funny though because um, you know that some of the things we just had funny conversations off of them, which was fun. So um, I'm gonna pick it if that's your speed. You know, it's the well, it, it could because what you do is you dial. So you have a dial and it's a blind dial. So you just spin it, and then when you're done, whoever's giving the clue opens it up, and you see where the you know where people will score if they guess it right. And then you close it back up, and you have a clue card. And so one of the clue cards was like vapes doesn't vape, right? And you know, and so you know give a clue you know it's like 30 year old men right because i was i was aiming for you know a little bit more toward vapes but you know not all the way there right where you know you might pick a different demographic or pick a person that you know vapes and everybody else know vapes right and so um anyway the conversation quickly turned to um my wife's aunt and uncle i guess both vape and so then it turned into jokes about them vaping and you know and, and, you know, whether or not people were embarrassed about talking about whether they vaped. It was really funny. And so, you know, it's that kind of a thing. And that's really what, you know, for me, I like the mental stimulation and the challenges that come with board games. But I also like the social aspect of it. And so if you're looking for the social aspect, I'd, I'd check that game out. It's called Wavelength. Wavelength or Wavelength. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, but you should be able to find it. Um, it's got a very colorful box. So could you say um, it turned into a very vapid conversation? <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. A um, few other things I'm going to put out there. I am currently uh, hiring some folks to help us run some meetups on JavaScript and Ruby and Angular, at least because those are our biggest shows right now. Um, and then uh, I'm also getting ready to put uh, J JavaScript Remote Conference uh, another JavaScript remote conference together probably in May. So if you want to speak at it or if you want to participate in it, I'm probably, I'm thinking about doing more than one track. And so I may also need somebody to MC one of the tracks. Um, anyway, just keep an eye out for it. Um, we usually get some pretty solid heavy hitters for that. And so um, if you're interested in being a part of that, let me know. Um, if you know anyone who wants to sponsor it, also let me know. Um, but yeah, that'll be at uh, jsremoteconf.com. Or you can just go to Top End Devs and click Conferences, and it'll it'll show it. So those are my picks. And then uh, finally, one last thing that I'm going to shout out, because I love them, is I got a couple new flavors of Built Bars. Uh, the Built Bars are, uh, I always joke that they're candy bars, but they're protein bars. Um, and since I'm doing low carb, they, they have like four net carbs and it's because they coat them in chocolate. Um, but they, you know, it, it's not like overly sweetened or anything. And so it, it keeps me in that range where I want to be for my carb counts. Um, and I'm really, really enjoying that. So I'm going to shout out about that. And that's pretty much what I got. AJ, did you want to do picks before Nick does or should we turn it over to oh, Nick? I can pull some picks out of the hat here. Okay. So, Actually, I just discovered this channel. So what I was doing was I, I was setting up YouTube Live for my church because we had this broadcast system that uh, was actually really good and really easy to use. But for some reason, they're abandoning it, uh, probably because there was never proper training. And uh, Anyway, but so we're switching over to YouTube Live, and I started doing this this thing. And then, and then, of course, YouTube wants to suggest to me all of these, uh, I guess, uh, this, what YouTube is trying to do, but it, but it, this, this atheist channel, and I actually really, really like it. It's called Genetically Modified Skeptic. I've watched uh, two halves of his videos, so just, I, I'd have to say this is one of the most Christian people I've seen on YouTube because his whole thing is about debating with uh, dignity. And he uh, he points out where some of these, uh, uh, th well, the, the two things I've seen is is basically there's some some Christian people that are not being polite or very Christian, <laughs> and and he picks apart their argument in a very non-emotional, 
uh, non-inflammatory way and and talks uh, and talks about it. And I just think that he handles it so respectfully. Um, and I I really like this kind of content, uh, stuff that goes against things that I believe metered way. Uh, or not necessarily goes against what I believe, but that might appear to go against some of the things I believe or, or have a different perspective. Um, genetically modified skeptic. Uh, but I, I do, I, there's this, there's this whole thing when you're, when you're a, a believer of faith, you have to be really open-minded about the how and the what as you hold to the why, because faith is about, the why it's not about the what and the how and i've i've had personal friends that when they start about science and reasoning and and whatnot they they lose their to me because the faith isn't about are, are all of the words verbatim correct it's about when you follow these principles do you reap the the good fruit of the good tree um, so I'm going to put that caveat on there because I don't want to steer anybody towards the end of their faith. And I think that sometimes when people approach things that are, I mean, I don't want to baby anybody and say not ready for it, but I, I think that is kind of a thing, milk before meat for those that are of faith. You probably know that expression. Um, but anyway, this channel, I'm going to watch more of his stuff. Hopefully I like more of it. I love, uh, I love this kind of, uh, metered debate style and, and then, of course, I'll, I'll pick the normal things. Actually, no, I'm, and one, one other thing is if you are interested, uh, I am looking for people to, to work with. I've got more work than I can handle. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me. I've got a very simple litmus to post here. If you can solve this litmus test uh, on your own in a reasonable amount of time, which um, I think that an hour would be reasonable to get most of the way there. And I think that it's certainly possible many people will get there within 15 minutes uh, to get most of the way there. But if you can solve this litmus test, then uh, I could I could probably uh, farm out some work to you. So if you're interested in that, and I don't I consider this to be a lid a, a mid level problem solving skill, uh, not not not. This is too difficult, but I do think it is above what most people would consider beginner. Um, so I'm going to post a link to that problem. And then, uh, yeah, uh, then the normal stuff. If you want to follow me on the YouTubes, on the Twitches, uh, Beyond Code is the more structured content. And then live streams and whatnot go under Cool Age 86. Gotcha. What you said reminded me of a meme I saw the other day on Facebook where Basically, they were saying, you know, it was a missed opportunity to not have Neil Young go on the Joe Rogan show and discuss with Joe what his issues were. And that kind of, you know, assuming they would both be um, civil to each other, I think could have been a really interesting uh, thing. If you've heard the controversy over Spotify, you know, just just that kind of a conversation, I feel like we lack a lot of times where it's it's, hey, look, you know, let's let's actually understand each other instead of just you know throwing barbs over the fence one way or the other so anyway nick do you have some picks i do and i got noise i got construction going on outside and they have just decided to increase the noise right about now yeah i i have two picks one uh, i also like board games and i like you probably might have heard of this one settlers of Catan. it's an mm, oldie good but one. uh mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a great one for the social aspect, you know, go about arguing with people and, you know, getting into little fights with them, et cetera. It's, it's kind of fun. And, uh, I want to uh, also suggest a TV show fixed recently that I really, really like. It's called Halt and Catch. Uh, it's uh, the history of sort of a startup, a tech startup uh, in Silicon Valley. They go. So this is the early days of computing. So you get a glimpse into, you know, the uh, like the birth of, of microcomputing and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. It's a brilliantly uh, done show. And I really like like that. So, yeah, those those are uh, a couple of picks for me. And I also wanted to say thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I really like we had some great questions and we had a, a, a really good debate. So I, I really love that. So thank you so much. 
I'm You're welcome. Thanks I didn't for offend coming. You too much, Nick. <laughs> I, I don't get offended. I, I I enjoy these because, you know, if we can handle skepticism from reason, from smart people, we are not able to defend and and come up with good for this. Then this technology is not very good, right? I mean, so. Uh, it's going to improve when when there there are more people approaching this with that right thing it's only going to get better and better and better it's far from perfect right now well i think i think we've seen that with all kinds of technologies and that's why i want to cover it is it's like okay well you know as we get a little further down the the rabbit hole on this yeah you know what what are the possibilities and what opportunities do we miss if we're not willing to even look at it so um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Thanks again for coming, Nick. Uh, till next time, folks, max out.